All right, good morning. So we are in Genesis part two. We're in lesson two, and today we have a, a single major subject to discuss, and that's the subject of sin. Now, one of the things that we have talked about um, up to this point uh, over and over is how in the book of Genesis are all the firsts, right? Um, the first introduction of who God is, the first introduction about man, the first um, uh, establishment of, of genders and gender roles and work and worship and all these things are there, right? The Sabbath day is instituted by God through his, re his day of rest. So all these things being first for us has given us an opportunity, um, I think, to kind of step back just a little bit. Sometimes don't we get a little bit tangled up in definitions of because the, the further you get down the road in the Word of God, the more that gets added in, right? We, and actually, it's a good thing, but it can also sometimes be a confusing thing because sometimes people take these things that really, what you need to do is, is come up higher to the higher level and, and view it from a, a higher altitude so that you're looking at a, from a better perspective and also so that you simplify things. Sometimes we overcomplicate. So... This week's homework was an opportunity to kind of get a nice balance of that. What she did for us was she introduced to us the, the idea of topical study. For those who haven't done that before, I think most of you all in here have done that before. Uh, but doing topical studies is discussed in their how-to study book, all right? Um, one of, it, it initially gets introduced in that chapter on um, where you're looking at, it call, it's called focusing in on the details, which is what we are doing right now. Chapter by chapter, we're focusing in on the details of each chapter. So you get that introduced to you in the section where it talks about list making. And so it begins the, the concept for you of the idea of looking at a passage like we have here in Genesis, isolating a subject, uh, setting that subject title down on a page and then begin to make a list of everything that you learn about that subject from your immediate context, right? So that's how you begin uh, a subject study, but then you need to expand it from there. So you all tell me before I take you to the, the, the teaching on it here in the How to Study book, you all tell me what did you see that Kay had you doing to expound your insight uh, on the subject of sin. What did you do for... Okay, so the immediate context list making, right? And then what? She took us to all different verses throughout the book. There you go. So we call that whole council yes. observation. So we're looking for the same subject throughout the council of God's word and we're continuing to build list making on our insights about that subject, right? Tell me what, what kind of obstacles do you see coming from going to whole council? Or, or were there obstacles for you when you just dropped into Romans or, or Thessalonians or Peter or wherever you went? What, were there any complications for you? Yes, okay. Give us uh, some thoughts on that. There you go. Exactly. That was perfect, James, because when you are looking at um, dropping into a whole council and you're dropping into different cross references, each cross reference has its own context, right? And so, some of the, one of the ones that we went into quite often was Romans. Did you notice that? And in Romans, does anybody know what, what what Romans is as far as context is concerned? What was its purpose for writing? Does anybody know that by chance or at least have a good guess? Yeah. Okay, so he's, we know the, the book itself is... is kind of a mixture of Jews and Gentiles, right? One of the things I think we talked about when we studied that was how schizophrenic he, he seemed because he'd go back and forth and back and forth. He talked first to the Jews and he talked to the Gentiles, back to the Jews, then back to the Gentiles. And he did does that throughout the entire writing of that particular book. Um, 
Very good. Yay. Thank you, Annette, because that was what I wanted to, to make sure. Right. It's a diatribe of, of legal standing. So now that you know that, what do you know about the concept of sin, how it's portrayed in that book? If it's a diatribe and it's a legal standing, it, it, he's giving us a, he is, def, we do know the whole book is a doctrine, right? It's doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. But it's doctrine from the perspective of your legal standing, right? So it's slightly different because in particular when we went into chapter 5, we see that, su that uh, subject discussion about federal uh, headship, right? And did anybody do any looking around on the computer about that federal headship information by chance? No? Do I... Okay, well, <laughs> that surprises me. Okay, because Romans 5 takes the subject of sin and it develops it from the perspective of a legal standing before God. It, it takes it to a different plane in a way concerning, I mean, the facts are still the facts. None of that changes. You're still drawing information, writing it down. The list is the list. But because it's a, a legal standing as well, besides just a law of God's, it's also a legal standing where you stand positionally with God. It's quite interesting to see the nuances that can come out of that. And this is where you start getting uh, disagreements among different theologians and how they view it and what they look at. Some theologians don't even like the idea of the subject of federal headship. Even though chapter 5 clearly teaches it. I mean, it's, it's completely obvious that this is what he's setting up is first you're in Adam, then you're in Christ, right? And in Adam came sin and in Christ comes justification. Uh, and so just knowing that, that's one example of all these places that we went to that you can end up with slightly different background information that you need to kind of be aware of that when you're looking in Romans, it's, he's talking legally, there's a legal position that God declared by his decreed word. He decreed that by legal standing, what happened to man in the garden with Adam? Adam sinned, and from that point for forth, what? Yeah, and who is it affect? The whole human race, not just Adam. It wasn't a legal affront against just Adam. It was a legal standing now that God says, okay, so from this point forward, all man are in my in in my declared decree they are they are decreed sinners and later we're going to talk about why that's true that we are all decreed in that way and it's and it's a fact and it's true but we need to kind of parse it out a little bit but because of that decree if you don't understand it fully there could not be a counterbalance decree for righteousness without it isn't that cool so it's really cool that this God put this in place so that he would be able to legally make a counter defense for us so that we could have a, 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 a change in position from being in uh, Adam to being in Christ. So we'll... Right, right. Rather than dead in our sins, now we can be alive through the... Right. Yeah, and then, okay, now I'm kind of glad you used that word law because not only is there the law as far as just simply a legal standing, but then there's also the law of Moses, and that's another subject matter. So when you drop into those, you often have to also nuance your thinking that what you're looking at when you're in those passages is the law of Moses for Israel, the nation, and you have to parse through and decide when does that apply to us even today and what parts of that was really just for Israel, that nation. Not that the principles, the fundamentals about it, the, the moral law, remains intact, but there's a, a legalistic standing that in our world today, how many of you know people who want to follow the Old Testament law? They, want to, they still want to practice the, the same feasts and all the holidays and practice the Sabbath. And, and certainly in Israel, they're doing that because they're Jews, right? So they're still living under the law, thinking that Jesus is, has not come yet, that their, their Savior has not come. But in America, for the most part, we are, that are Christians, we are, are, how much of that law are we still under? 
right? So can you kind of start to see where what seems like a real simple conversation can also get a little bit complicated when you go into whole council observation. You have to be aware of the, of the different contextual settings. Thank you for that, James. Okay, now, <laughs> that's what I'm here for. That's right, I live to serve. Okay, so chapter 15 of your How to Study Bible, your Bible, is a uh, chapter called Studying Topically by Subject. Okay. That's where you're going to want to go and read. It's very short. It's like two or three pages. It's not very long. But the, she goes through a uh, process for how to do observation of a topic throughout the Word of God. And she gives you some of those little tips about what to watch out for and also what to consider. So you might want to go back in and read that for yourself because I, I, I wish I had, I'm sorry, but I wish I had said something before. You had two weeks. You could have read it and it might have been helpful. We'll see. Okay. But at least at this point now, we know that's there. It's available to you. You just have to go look it up. I always encourage that you continue to use your how-to study book to develop your skill so that you better understand what you're doing in your homework, right? It makes your homework better. Okay. So let's go back and I'm not going to write this part of my discussion with you on the board. I just want to go through and uh, Again, set context. Now, one of the things we did this week in homework was this temptation, right? As one of another one of our our con, uh, cross references for whole council observation. Okay, so thinking about Jesus, she had she did ask some real probing questions about how was Jesus's temptation the same or different from what was going on in the garden, right? And at first, I, I could only really see the similarities, but I wasn't really noticing the differences. Did anybody go there in their mind about the differences at all? Okay, I didn't either, so don't feel bad. It didn't hit me until I started writing up my chart, and I wanted to go back and, again, for myself, set my mind in context. Go ahead. Yes, there you go. Jesus fasted, Adam ate. Um, there were wild beasts with Jesus, and then an animal was killed. Right. Or the animals are at peace at, up to that point, right? An angel ministered to Jesus and a cherub band, uh, Adam and Eve, from the garden of Eden. And then Aren't those good? That's a good one. That, a good, that, all those are good. He is the Word of God, yeah. I love this. Okay. okay, see, what we could do is just take your list and put it on the board, and that would be in, in totality what I finally started drawing out of it when I went back and began to reset my context because I, I got to thinking about, because I had finished all my homework, then I go back and I do my lesson planning, and I spend several hours, usually a full day, working on this chart to try to get it in an order that makes sense, right? Well, when I did that, I just went back and said, okay, so what's the setting for Adam and Eve? What's, what's going on in their world around them as they're being, quote, tempted, right? How, how, if you were to put it in your way, what would you compare it? How would you make the comparison? Well, all their needs are being met. Yeah. They're laying in the lap of luxury, practically, right? The fruit almost jumps off the tree into their hand. And, oh, yeah, those poor babies, they were under such distress, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Right. Yes, it wasn't just, it wasn't just good, it was very good. As a matter of fact, I want to talk about that. Very good, very. This is number 3966, if you want to take a note on this. It's M-A-O-D. It means exceedingly, greatly, abundance to a great degree with muchness. I thought that was cute. <laughs> then the other word is good, and it's 2896, T-O-W-B. It means excellent, pleasant, goodly, best, fair, beautiful, and agreeable to the senses. So they're in a garden that is exceedingly beautiful and perfect. 
everything is in its exact condition of supreme working. It meets all their needs. It's beautiful. It, this, I'll guarantee you their vegetables and fruits were much more nutritious for them than ours are, right? Uh, so it's excellent. It, it is in the, it's the most fairest of positions possible for human beings to be in. In other words, are they hurting? Are they suffering? Are they in distress? No, they are in the happiest moment, the best condition at the, in, there, there you go. That was my other, my other thought when I started comparing was, there was Jesus who had been ripped from heaven. I know he gave it up willingly. I know he took on humanity, but in my mind, I'm seeing him being rinsed away from God the Father, placed here on this planet Earth, and we know what it's like, right? And so what a contrast between that and what was going on with Adam and Eve. Um, so God, who is the creator, you know, we defined how God is presented to us in those first two chapters. So God in chapter one is what? Creator. And in chapter two? Yahweh co and covenant God, right? So he's personal and relational. Okay, then, since uh, one of the major purposes for the writing of this book is to know who is God, but then the other is to who is, who is man. And for man, who, what do we now know about man at this point? He's, how was he created? In the image of God. And uh, what was God, what, what did God give to man as far as... Um, I guess designed roles and you know what were they supposed to be doing and what were, were they given to do? Rule over the earth. I mean the high, how many of us want to rule over the earth? Well not me, <laughs> not me, but I mean really that is for, for a lot of uh, people you know they want to rule at least if nothing else their own households right and that of course the husbands are given that designed role to do it and to do it with gentleness and love and all those things. But there are people who that is their, their greatest degree. And yet here, Adam and Eve were given that. They were given rulership over their entire world at that moment. They were given dominion. So they were given that. But then there was the counterbalance to it, which was what? What else were they given? One rule. One rule. They were given rulership over everything, and they were given one rule for they themselves to obey, right? Um, when you hit chapter three, there's one more quality about mankind that we really do get, I think, a very strong um, understanding about who we are as far as our characteristics. And what is that? What happened with man when he was told one rule to obey? He broke it. He, broke it, he disobeyed it. So in the disobeying it, besides the, the fact that it was an act of sin, what does that tell us then about man how God created us and what he gave to us? Choice. Choice. Free will. Man was given free. This is a very interesting point because you're talking fundamentally, chapter 3, you're just beginning your doctrines about who is man. And the idea that man has free will and is given uh, the will and the choice and the opportunity to choose to obey or choose not to, right? to choose to believe God or to choose not to believe God. Now, interestingly, there are many denominations out there and other religions that indicate to us that we are nothing more than a puppet, that God has all the control over us. Yes, God is sovereign, but does the text show us that man was given free will? Did God intervene or, or stop man from committing the act that he, he did? No. So this is interesting to me because I think in many ways, if you just go back to the 101s of what you're coming to learn about who is man, one of the very first things you have to come to understand is God gave you free will. He gave you opportunity to make a choice on whether to obey him, whether to believe him, right? And the fact that God did not intervene to stop man or Satan for that matter in that account in chapter 3, I think tells us a lot. Well, you just point out something very important, and that is Satan had, had the ability, the will, to go contrary right. to God. So not only did people have that, but... 
the angels apparently did as well. And although we've not done a topical study on our angels yet, we do know that these angels were, pre we, we, I guess we learned this a couple weeks back, but that the angels were present at the creation of the world. They were there in the heavenly realm watching. They rejoiced when God laid the foundations of the earth. So to me, I, I mean, I don't know all exactly what that means, and there's a lot of debate about that. But the Word of God does not tell us when they were created, but that God created them. All that is, everything that exists, God created. Um, but they were already created before we were created. And therefore, that makes them distinct from us, different from us. They are spirit. We are flesh, right? We are created from the earth. They apparently are from the heavenly realms, the spiritual realms. So there's some distinction going on there. But Satan was allowed, permitted by God to come in and be that one who would tempt us. Uh, what did you learn about temptation and God in our work this week? God does not tempt. Right? He's not tempted and he does not tempt. So, the, but the fact that he allowed us to be tempted tells us a lot about the fact that man is given free will to choose. That is not God. God does not intervene in that. He allows that for us. Do you think that's a positive or a negative? <laughs> Both. Okay. Let's not be on the fence about it. <laughs> okay. So explain what you think is um, good about having free will. Okay. I love that you said that, Annette. Did y'all hear that? That it, because we are created in His image, one of the things that God has Himself is free will, right? All right. What else? In that free will, if we're given the opportunity to make choices and to choose to obey or not obey, um, what if we weren't given free will? What would that, how would that change even the whole storyline of the Bible for that matter? Things wouldn't, wouldn't be your fault. Yeah. If God is making you do stuff, then you can't resist. So you can wash your hands of it and you say, oh, and then... If there's no choice and bottled that, but if, if God is the one who chooses or not for each one of us individually, why bother even evangelizing? And how do we know if we really love him? Right. right. How do you even identify true love? Yes. Wasn't there a song years ago about if you if it's really love, you've let it go, it'll come back? You know, because it's a it's about free will and choice, right? All right. Okay, so that kind of sets context for everything that we're going to be looking at now. That, that, that kind of gives us a nice little rounded picture of saying, okay, they're in a perfect place. There's no duress for them. They, are, they have been given dominion over everything else. Only one stinking tree can you not touch, right? But, they, but yet they did. And so in that scenario, in that mindset, uh, when we get to Jesus then to lay that next to what was going on for Jesus when he went through his temptation. Wow, what a contrast that is for us and to see what, what God really took on and what God really endured for us. Is well, not even to mention that when Jesus quotes scripture, it's correct. When he tries to say what God said is wrong. Mm -hmm. so Yes, yes. So, all right, so first sin. Let's talk about this and let's get going on. It seems like my, my other marker is missing. I wonder what this one is. I was going to use blue. I don't know why. Okay, let's talk about the first sin. First of all, we, we know that God gave Adam law, right? So that's the first thing we want to talk about. He told him what, basically? What was the law? Yeah. You shall not eat. And it was of a, that one particular tree, right? And so I'm just going to leave it at that, 217, so I don't have to give you a lot of detail on that. But you shall not eat of that one tree, right? 
So there's your little tree. You shall not eat of that one tree. And then he said, and then he gave him because a, a understanding though, then that if he did eat what? He is going to die. So he, he up front, he, he gave him a scenario that this is the law. You have free will. You may choose or not to choose or choose not to obey or to obey. But let me warn you that if you choose to disobey, there is a consequence that will come with it. Now, if you don't have free will, would you need the consequence? No, because it would be God's choosing. There's not even a point to the tree in the test to begin with if it's God's choosing, right? So this concept of free will is really fundamental in this storyline. Okay, he says, you shall not, you will surely die. Okay, so that sets up the law. Now we know what's going on there. The other thing that was very... Uh, important to kind of look at was the, the flow of thought in this when, when God gave Adam in chapter 2 this law, where was woman? She was not there yet. She had not yet been made by God, right? So when God made her, what was the, the purpose for the woman? Why did God give Adam a woman to begin with? As a helper, right? And he called her suitable. Do you remember what that word by definition meant? It was a good one, you guys, and it was really kind of important. She's a she's not just a she's not just a um, a male female, right? She's not just his helper. There you go. It was a completer. There you go, because they are two halves of a whole. She's one half, he's one half, and they make a whole. Without the other, the complementary part of the of the one of the two becoming one is the count the balance that they bring to the picture. And as well, what happens with that picture? What kind of a picture is it? What is it designed by God to be a picture of? Right, made in the image of God. And what is the design picture of the marriage? Christ and the church. So all of this plays into this understanding of what's going on here. He gave, her, he gave to Adam a suitable helpmate, right? Suitable meaning co a corresponding helper, one who works in harmony with him for a common goal. Oops. Okay, so we already know where this seems to be going, right? Now... There are, there are designed roles. We're just going to put these up here because I think they, they weigh in on what we're going to be looking at as well. Uh, let's just talk about man's designed role. What was man? What was his primary, three primary things? Priest, protector, and provider. And what about woman? She was his suitable, what? Helpmate, right? So she's a helpmate. And what was her primary role in the, in the couple's relationship was to do what? Yes, child bearer. Well, we know he doesn't bear them, right? You got that right. <laughs> and then one other part, one other quality, I think I always like to put it up and I'm not... I'm not, I'm not, it's not quite as distinctive in, in its distinction, but what is it that the woman primarily does do as the helpmate and as the child uh, bearer, then what does she do in those relationships? Nurtured. Nurtured. Yeah, she's the nurturer. So those are the, the two designed roles, the two primary functions of the two. Now, already I'm pretty sure most of us are looking at this going, boy, did they both miss the mark. Right? When they, when they did their uh, situation. Okay, now let's move on to the next part, the serpent. Um, what did we learn about the serpent when you were in there doing your observations for that chapter? This is in chapter 3, 1 to 5, primarily. We look at that serpent, and who is he and what's he doing? Well, the first thing we learned about him is what? 
He was crafty, more crafty than all of the other creatures that God had created of the field, of the beasts of the field. So the, the main thing we learned about him is this serpent was a beast of the field. He was an animal that God had created from the earth, right? So he's unusually, he's a serpent, he's crafty. Apparently he might, he walked or flew, one or the other, right? That's what I thought too. Either had legs or he flew or maybe both or we don't know. But, but we know he didn't have the ability to walk upright anymore afterwards. He was put on his belly. So something happened after the fall uh, as his judgment. We see that when we hit those last verses. D oh, okay. All right, so the crafty serpent. Now, what did this crafty serpent do in this encounter with the woman? What did he do? Yeah, he sure did. And so he had to engage with her about that, right? So this serpent, he engaged Eve. That's very interesting uh, about what God said. What do you think? I think we did talk about this last week. I don't see it either. Is there anything in the science world that indicates to us that animals ever talked or had the cognitive ability to formulate? There's nothing in the science world that serpents talk either. Right. So my point is, they, they, it very clearly is stated in the, in the Bible that the serpents spoke to her. Right. And there's no other... And there's, which is, by the way, why I kept saying when you go back and look at this, now the serpent... This, this particular serpent, the serpent, was more crafty than any beast of the field. And to me, that should have been a ding ding. This is very weird. Why is this serpent talking? Apparently, I think just from that little tiny, they don't give us a lot, but that little tiny bit there, and, the, and just reasoning it out logically, what we know is animals don't talk, right? although Dr. Doolittle has a one-up on us, but animals don't really talk. Uh, they, they, don't and language. they don't, and I don't, and I don't know the science part of this, but I would venture pretty boldly to say they don't have the ability, right? Um, you can teach a parrot to repeat words, but they don't really, it's just a sound, just a sound for them. That's exactly right. They don't have that brain power to be able to do that. So the fact that this serpent was talking, I think she should have gone weird, weird. He's talking. I've never had an animal talk before. Okay, back in uh, 1 verse yeah, 24, well, Satan would not have been a creeping thing, but this serpent would have been a creeping thing. Yeah. Yes. Okay, here's Okay, this is this is a good point, Carol. Tell me if the serpent is simply an animal that God created. How does Satan come into play on this? He uses him. What do we call that in vernacular today? Demon possession. So, Satan possessed the animal and used him to speak through Well, there's a lot of creeping things. There's spiders. There's, you know, think of all the creeping things in the earth. Yeah. There are a lot of creeping things even still on the earth. Spiders and snakes and, and worms and, yeah. Okay. Okay, are you, are you okay now? Any other questions? Yeah, he could have been, yeah. I still think that certainly, he, I don't think he completely changed. He had a, a curse put upon him that he would no longer be able to walk upright and get out of the dirt, apparently. Now he will slither on his belly and eat dirt. Um, much in the same way when God gave consequences to man and woman, they were, they were related to their daily living, right? And why do you think that is? What is God trying to accomplish by giving us something that affects our daily living? 
to remind us to be constantly in our face as a remembrance of what occurred, okay? All right, so the same thing. Now with the, an now with the animal, uh, by the way, I do want to clarify and make sure. The animal doesn't have the ability to reason all this. Only men, men women do. The animal, however, since God put a curse on the animal, why would he have done that? Rather than destroy him. We talked about this last time. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember when he said about the animal, he said, uh, more cursed will you be, right? Uh, more than every beast of the field. Now, what was meant by that statement? Yeah, and cursed in what manner? What, what happens to the earth and to everything dies? First of all, death enters, so all these animals are going to start to die. And what was the curse for, for man? The, yeah, thorns and thistles, and now he's going to be slithering on his belly in the midst of that. So on the one hand, do you think the, the ground-bearing thorns and thistles and the, um, the death enter in, does that affect all the beasts of the field? Yes. yes. But now this beast is going to be more cursed. Why? Because he was used by Satan. So now what did God do with that created creature? Rather than destroy it and, and obliterate it, right? What did he do? He left it as a reminder. And in doing that, he becomes more cursed because now what? Every time people see him, we go, ooh, a snake, <laughs> right? And it's a reminder to us about what? What occurred in the garden. Isn't this just pretty cool? It kind of starts to all start make sense. Um, I was thinking about that, I think it was Balaam and the talking donkey. Did somebody brought that one up last week. Um, it's the same thing there. There was an animal that God used in that moment to speak through to that prophet who was about to disobey God, right? And it was simply a possession of the animal, the beast at the time. Do donkeys talk? No. So to me, that man in that moment should have gone, oh my gosh, a donkey is talking to me. I better be listening to find out, is this from God or is this satanic? Right? Uh-huh. They do not have the pronounced or functional hip bones now that snakes no longer, now that snakes no longer have legs. Wow. So there's, there is scientific evidence then within the, the, the body, the biological makeup of a snake that at one time there may have been legs. So that's very interesting. See, I knew there's, isn't it fun? Precept work is so fun because you get to dig into these little things which probably me, really don't matter a whole lot in the big picture, but they answer a lot of our questions, <laughs> things that just annoy us otherwise. Okay, so we have a crafty serpent. Um, uh, concerning that uh, also, what do we see in um, his activity? What does he do when he engages with the woman? He misquotes, right? And in the misquoting of the, the word of God to, to Eve, what is his agenda? What's he trying to accomplish? Yeah, he wants her to doubt, right? And then consequently, if she starts to doubt, then what? Disobey. To disobey. So he had an agenda, didn't he? He was tempting her. So he tempted Eve. Yeah, to not believe God. Oh, yeah, he sure did. Do not believe God, and he, she, he wanted her to disobey. Now, isn't that interesting that this fallen angel, who, who, who he himself, we know from having done work a couple weeks ago, he himself disobeyed. He, he rebelled against his designed role and place and function. And as a consequence of that, he was cast out of 
his place in the heavenly realms. He no longer now walks in heaven with God in the, in the beautiful garden of Eden that's there. And he is now this, this tempter who tries to draw others also away from obeying God. That's right. Misery loves company. That's right. It's, it just seems kind of strange, though, doesn't it? It's like, why would you, if you already recognize and are suffering some of the consequences of your own fall, why would you want to drag other people into that same mess? What does that tell you about him? He's just plain evil. He does not have one good a thread of goodness in him at all to know where he was in that that exalted place among even the angels he was exalted right the most beautiful and and the cherubim who covers he was the one who was right there in the presence of God covering God himself and now he is cast to the earth what a contrast and yet he is the tempter now of humanity um we didn't really look any research on this, but do you, what do you think is going on with him concerning man? Why is it important to him? I mean, he, he already tripped up many of the angels. He got a, at least a third of them to fall. That's what the scripture says, a third fell. So why would he now come against humanity? Yeah. We are image bearers for God himself. He hates God. It, and he wants to be in the place of God, yes. He wants to be God, above God. And now he's trying to thwart the, the work that God set in place among humanity. He, wanted, he wants us to fall as well. So... Yes, yes. He's a murderer and has been a murderer from, from the beginning, right? Yes. Now, one more piece of this uh, engagement that was going on here with uh, the serpent. Where was Adam when all this was taking place? He was right there. What is that about? I'm just going to put this part of the verse. Her husband was with her. meaning Eve, right? That's in verse 6. Okay, so this is verse uh, 1. This is verse 6. And he tempted Eve. That's basically in verse 4 and 5, where he, he t enticed her to not believe God and to disobey God. Now, concerning the woman, what do we know about her? In this scenario, she engaged with him about the word of God, right? About what the law was. What are we, uh, what are we able to draw as a conclusion about her knowledge of that? Uh, so many times through the years, I, I can remember Sunday school classes and spending hours on it, arguing about, well, she didn't know because she wasn't there and God gave it to Adam. And I know we're all kind of rolling our eyes because we're going to, have you not read the, the record? <laughs> because... It, not only that, but they also often want to let us Adam off the hook because they many times I was told he wasn't even there, right? It, he was just talking to her. It was just even the serpent alone talking. Well, as if you keep reading the storyline, they make God makes sure he interjects in there in her husband with her, right? So he was there, but what was he not doing? He wasn't protecting her. He wasn't engaging in the conversation, right? So the conversation is going on between Eve and the serpent, and the man is present, but he, apparently he says nothing. I mean, or at least that's what we see in the storyline. Okay, so the woman, he, she has a conversation. Uh, um, with that beast, right? With a beast of the field. And I'm putting that on here because that alone is hysterical. The more you think about it, the more we talk on it, because what you come to realize is it was a beast of the field. <laughs> if you're starting to have a conversation with a snake or a donkey or anything else, guys, you better be checking to say, 
what's going on here? This this is unusual. This is weird. This shouldn't be happening. There, it should have been a clue, right? Oh, and especially when they answer back. Yeah, it's you know, it's one thing if you talk to yourself and you answer back, but when you're talking to an animal that has no ability to have conversation, you know something. Well, yeah, but do you really expect your dog to pick out which things to put your money into? And I mean, do you really want him to decide should this woman be your wife or not? Or I hope not, right? Some people do, but you know. <laughs> okay, so now we're again, we're in Genesis 3, 1 to 5 on this. We're looking at her. Now, what do we know she knew? Because she conversation with him, right? What does she converse with him about? The one law that was given to them. Is she able to uh, articulate what? Yes, yeah, she knows the laws. So she knew. Yeah, but she knew the law. She, it wasn't like, even though she adds to it, you're right, that's where, where she messes up in it, but she knows the law. So she knew the law, and then she added to it. Now, and she added to it. Now, tell me what that tells us about her mindset. And when she added to it, how did she add to it? Did she loosen it up so that it was more generous and more? She tightened it. She added a harshness to the law. Now, if you do that about anybody, if you think about your conversations in years past and you've had a con what. If you talk about someone else and you say, yeah, they did this, and not only did they do that, but they did this, even if they didn't go to that extreme, but you add that in, what does that tell you about how you're feeling about that individual? What is her, what's going on in her heart? It seems like there's already in her heart a little seed of resentment. Uh, uh, did, did anybody see that or catch that at all? Did, did, if you, if your husband says you can spend ten dollars, um, and you go to the store and you're with your friend and you see something for eleven dollars, no, he said I can only spend nine ninety nine. I cannot, you know. I mean, you you bump it down and and you you tighten it down in order to express to your friend how tight your, you know, your budget is and how you think that's unfair. Isn't that kind of it? It's a, there's a resentment going on there in her. Are you guys seeing that at all? Yeah, I saw that. I just was, I was, it's indicating there's discontentment in her about the law that God had made. That she seemed to think that what he did was either unfair, restrictive, or something. But it also kind of reveals to us a little bit more about the character of man. What happens when you do have law? What happens to us? It can rub you the it can rub you the wrong way. Now sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. Have you noticed that? When is it that you're okay with laws? When it applies to someone else. <laughs> That's true. When it applies to someone else, are there any times when you don't mind a law because it? It maybe you feel like it's actually good because it's going to protect you. So in your mind, you've already made a determination. Yeah, that's a law. I know it's kind of restrictive, but it's for my safety, right? Could Eve have had that attitude about what God had done? If she, had, if she was mature. <laughs> she, I mean, I'm just trying to get y'all to think on her mindset at the moment. God gave them one law and one law only. And yet when she has a conversation about this snake who's tempting her to, di to not believe God and to disobey God, her reply is to add a harshness degree to that law that was given. And what to me that shows is there's a little rebellion already going on in her heart. There's already a discontentment or a little bit of a distrust. Uh, what's his agenda? Is what he's doing really good? Is does he really have my best interest at heart, or is he withholding something from me? But Satan did that by essentially calling it a law, you know, a rule. Yeah. Are there any rules in your in this king, this gorgeous kingdom that you have? Well, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't like rules. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. It just I think in a way, what is it Paul talks about in Romans about the law? What is the purpose of the law? Yeah, it reveals to us the sin, 
and it and it draw and it brings up in us a, a opportunity to either obey or not obey, and it reveals to us that we are at at our very being, at our core of our being, we are rebellious against law, imposed judgments, especially if we don't like it. Okay, uh, I mean, think of some of the things that are going on in our our nation today about certain rules and laws, right? Some of us like the laws, some of us don't like the laws, and there's this constant battle that's going on between the two views about that particular law. So again, it kind of goes back to the heart of each one of those two views. And the heart of one says it's a good law, the other one says, no, that's a bad law, right? Oh, she added, okay, yeah, she said, and, not, and neither shall you touch it, okay, so she added to the law, so what she did is she took the basic principle that God says, you shall not eat of this tree, lest you die, right, and you shall surely die, and she said, you, you shall not, yeah, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, you know, so she added to it to, to indicate, to me, that indicated there was some some a measure of discontent, even before Satan showed up, by the way. That was my major point. That's what I'm saying. Cool, right? She had already... She gave herself like, you know what, I shouldn't even go near the tree, because if I get near the tree, I touch it, then right. it's not easy to just reach up. But if I just make a... I see it, I like it. Yeah, yes, I yes. Like but I think it's interesting that, though, that Satan seems to have figured this out. He already kind of knew where the discontentment would be. He hit her in the area of vulnerability. He approached it from the perspective, did not God say you could have everything? Oh, yes, everything except this one tree. Neither shall you touch it. And that's where he was able to poke her in the right places. Didn't he say at first, you shall not eat anything? Yeah, yeah. So he was saying, no, you can't eat any tree. I don't think that's what he was saying there. That's what I get. It says, indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. So it's saying, did... Well, did but it's in the midst of the garden, or the center of the garden. Not eat from any tree. Right, but he's asking her, he's saying, you know, indeed, like he's questioning, indeed, God said you can't eat anything from the garden. She's like, no, we can, we just can't eat from that tree, or touch it, mm -hmm. or we'll die. If our heart was right, that's what would be a normal reaction. Yeah, we can eat from any tree. And do they even know what death is at this point that time? Apparently, they had a concept of it because they... Well, the, it, the why would God it? impose a, a, a warning if they didn't understand the concept? It doesn't mean that they hadn't, they hadn't seen it yet, but see, God, had, God created Adam and Eve intelligent. Mm -hmm. they, had, they, had full, they had knowledge of things that you and I takes a lifetime to to grasp but they were they were created from the beginning with this full concept of all these different principles so. yeah they for so. i know they knew how to was, they were there under the tree obviously mm -hmm. maybe she was looking at it and that the lust you know we, we could be the lust of the eyes could be it. but we do know this he hit the one law yep. the only law that was there he nailed it. So apparently, Satan has a pretty good grip on the concept of what temptation is all about, too, and what caused him to fall, and therefore, he's using that to work against her in this. Okay, so she knew the law. She added to it, she, and she added harshness, right? And that's in verse 3. Okay, now, indicating there's some kind of discontentment. So then what happened? Once he brought this to her attention, then what's the next thing that happens? Then she saw. <laughs> she looks. It says she saw that the tree was what? Good. Good. Yeah. No, she's really... But apparently she's looking at it through a little different eye at this moment, right? She's saying it's good for food, it's a delight to the eye, and it's desirable to make one wise, right?
Okay, and so that's all in verse 6 of Genesis. And then, the, and then as soon as she did this process of, of seeing it, and what would you say is going on here in these three parts right here? She's contemplating it. She's chewing it over. She's, she's entertaining the ideas, right? It's like she's, first she just simply saw it, but then she dwelt on it. She, she kind of embraced the whole idea and started dancing around in her mind and thinking more. You know, and we did kind of jokingly talk about it. it's kind of like being on a diet, and you, you know, you're not supposed to eat that candy or that cookie or whatever it is that you crave. And as soon as you're on a diet and you know you're not supposed to do it, that's what you want to do. That seems to be innately built into every one of us as human beings, right? And so the end of it is what did she do? She ate. And then, by the way, what also happened? Uh huh. And what did he do? He ate also, right? He ate. So that's the conclusion. She ate and he ate. And he was with her. Her husband was with her. All right. So that lays down that. Now, one of the things you did then in your homework was she took you to go look at 1 John chapter 2. To, to, again, whole council kind of developed this idea of what's going on right here and what she saw. So what I want to do is parallel these. So this is the Genesis 3 record. Now we're going to look at 1 John. And it was in 2.19. And I do really like that particular passage because it... Um, uh, that was... It's going to be on page 22. So it was right at the beginning. Right after we started, you know, she said, we're going to focus this week on the subject of temptation. She wanted you to go back and look at... Uh, and, to, and basically list in a list, much like what I just did. She wanted you to do this and say, what do you see going on in that Genesis 3 account? What occurred? What is happening? What is the devil trying to get Eve to do, right? And then note the three things which lead up to the eating of the fruit. So that's what we have done now. So we're right in line with what she asked us. First John chapter 2 then, go and look in the New Testament to see how this is further stated from a whole council of God's word, right? How is it, how does First John define it? It's the, mm-hmm. Okay, the lust of the eyes and the lust of the eyes. And number three, it's the boastful pride. Yeah, boastful pride of life. Okay, so how do those line up? Do you. S oh, yeah, sorry, you're right. 216. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> Paying attention. <laughs> okay. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's on page 22. <laughs> oh, you don't have your book? Okay. All right, so that's, so here we go. So it's good for food. That's the lust of the flesh. And you see how the food is what satisfies the flesh, right? We see the delight of the eyes, again, the lust of the eyes. And then the desire to make one wise is that boastful pride of life. So we see exactly a, a, tip for tat all the way down the line, the New Testament confirms for us then what we've already seen in the old. So in the old where we kind of have to draw it out ourselves, just, you know, by making lists, but in the New Testament, he gave us what they call a simple list right in the text. This is what the, this is what comes from the world. All that's in the world, this is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. The thing I really like about being able to go into the New Testament and do that is when you see a confirmation verse back up what you've already observed somewhere else it affirms for you and I as inductive students that we that we observed it correctly okay mm-hmm 
Okay, so Eve's issue, Eve's problem here is really multifaceted. Number one, she engaged with the snake that she shouldn't have engaged with. That should have been a warning to her when she saw something unusual like that. When you're seeing signs and wonders, miracles occurring, don't just assume that they are good. These can be actually bad, so you have to be really careful. The secondary thing is, um, when she engaged in this conversation, she altered God's word. That's a problem. And it doesn't mean that you, I mean, I don't think that any of us have to know verbatim, word for word scriptures, but, we, but it'd be good if we did, right? But at least you need to know that the principles of what you're saying is correct. If you're trying to make a point, make sure that your point is being made accurately with what God has said about that subject or whatever. Then the other thing with her is she, number one, first of all, did not call on God. You're right about that. I mean, that's a biggie. But even if she had not called on God, who else was with her? Adam. 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 <laughs> yeah. And okay, so let's go back to, the, to her defined role again. What is she called? Helpmate. The helpmate. So she's the helpmate and, and she's the, the suitable companion. As, as a suitable companion, they're supposed to be in unison, in oneness of mind and heart, effort, work, right? They're supposed to be working together on this. She had the, she was there as his companion, and as the companion, before you, you make a major decision that's going to land you in death, you will surely die. The, I would certainly think that she should have gone to her husband. Yes. Not me. Sorry. Yeah. But it does not tell us that she engaged in conversation with him at all. I think what's interesting about it is the fact that what we're really seeing here is right off the bat from from moving from chapter one and two right into chapter three. The very first thing we see happen is when a temptation came, the entire system broke down. I mean, everything broke down. She misquotes God. She doesn't believe God. She doesn't obey God. She doesn't ask her husband, right? And, and she's not that companion to him that she's supposed to be. She's not the lead. She's the follow. And then Adam, you're both supposed to Well, yeah. And then we can flip it and say all about Adam. Adam didn't do his part either. And by the way, in the end of all of this, who does God ultimately hold responsible for this? He called out Adam. And that should be a really harsh reminder to our husbands. And I, I, it, it, they really are to rein their wives in when the wives are stepping beyond where they should go, right? It doesn't mean women can't lead. It doesn't mean women can't operate in the world in, in positions of leadership of various kinds. But, it does, but a woman should always be under the authority of her own husband, for sure. Also under the authority of her pastor in her church, right? And, and even beyond that, I would say that, it, you know, when there are men present, we should give them the respect that's due them, right? Simply because God has placed them in that position of order over us. It doesn't mean we're doormats. It just means their job is to look out for us and watch out for us and protect us. So, so Yeah, I guess I never thought about that. You're right. What, what women don't know about men, you need to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is a burden. No, it is. Absolutely. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. And then, oh, you mean you're going to hold me accountable for the things that come out of my mouth? <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, and yet he's responsible to make sure paychecks go out. That, that all the, the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted in re, re, Things go wrong. Who does the vice president right, call? Right, right. Not the guy on the line. No. You call the guy at the top. That's it. You're, you're absolutely right. So I just think that the beginning of, of 
Genesis is laying things down. Now, what's, what I want you to keep in mind is everything that we're looking at here today, although a lot of this is fundamentals for us because we're just talking about the subject of sin. We're really familiar with sin. All of us could certainly identify what sin is, right? However, I, the, 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 when you step back from it and really contemplate the dynamics of what's going on here and who did what and why, what were the motives behind what's going on here? What motivates a person to challenge or to add to God's word or to challenge God's law or to listen to a deceiver who you know has not got your best interest at heart simply by the fact that he's tempting you to disobey God who already told you if you do this, you're going to die. And so we have to kind of evaluate all this. And then as we move into the rest of Genesis and we're looking at the life of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all these qualities, all these pieces of this backdrop that we're laying today, these are going to affect how we're looking at what's going to go on in the rest of this book. Because we're looking at who is God, who is man, and who is man in relationship to God. How are we to, as children of God, walk in a manner that's, that's worthy and holy? God literally says to us, I am holy, be holy. And you're like, how can I be holy? How can I do that? Well, at least today we're going to look at the idea of temptation and sin and how it is that we can overcome that, right? All right. Jesus and therefore rule the world and I think that's what Satan wants in the garden. He yes. wants to destroy man's ability. Yeah. So he's still working. You, you know what? That's a good point. I hadn't really thought of that. In a way, what's going on here is he's still trying to, to take God's place. Right. He's, he rebelled against God to begin with because he wanted to put himself in the place of God. He wanted to usurp God. And that's what he's still doing here. Here, God is our is our Yah, he's Yahweh, he's Jehovah, right? He's the Elohim. And, and uh, the snake, the serpent has come in, Satan, through this, this snake. He's talking to her. He wants to usurp God in all that. He wants to be our Lord and our master. And yes. Yes, yes. He's using his own sin, and he's also continuing with his sin. So he didn't learn a thing from his fall. He doesn't even feel sorry that he fell. He's not repentant in any shape or form. He is continuing to rebel against God, God's plan, and God's people. Amazing. He's not redeemable. And so that, I think that's the difference between Satan and man. That's true. Right, and he knows that. And he wants to take as many with him as he can, but, yeah. but again, mankind has the ability to redeem. Yes. And that makes such a difference. It certainly does, absolutely. And, and w I wish we had more time to go into the, you know, the idea behind that. Why, why does man get a savior and the angels don't, you know? But we don't, we're not talking that subject today. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, you know, man was made a little lower than the angels for a period of time while we're on this earth. We, we were given dominion over the earth, though, but, but Satan stepped in and we submitted to Satan on this. And so now there's a constant battle for our position as God declared for us to have, the, the designed role that man holds. And Satan, who is constantly trying to thwart that. Yeah. And the whole time we're talking about all this, I think about little children, little two-year-olds. Oh, gosh. Yeah. They're just, rebellious from the just like Eve, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever had... <laughs> yeah. Well, we talked about that last week on those, those old... Yeah, those old art link letter and old, you know, where the little kids and they're put uh, cookies put out there and they have to not touch it, and, and they're they're trying so hard not to. They want to touch it, but they just, yeah, it is, and it just to me immediately 
from the womb they come out with a defiant nature in them. And you see that. Um, and scripture supports that, that we are sinners from the womb, literally from the womb, which just tells you what about how we were made then. Were we made with a free will? If we didn't have a free will, would we rebel? No. If we didn't have free will, we would just be compliant because we'd just be doing whatever God said. But because we have free will and we have the ability to make a choice and God steps back and allows that, then he allows us to uh, suffer the consequences of whatever it is that we do. And that's all so evident everywhere in Scripture. All right. So temptation now. We have a topical study then on that. Let's look at that word for temptation because you looked that one up. That's on page 24. It's number 3985. P-E-I-R-A-Z-O. How is it defined, the word temptation itself? To test. Mm-hmm. Now, this was interesting, the word to test itself, to test, like to give a test, to test you. Interesting, right? To test. Go ahead. Well, I found something interesting about it. It says, says it is a neutral word. Whether it is good or bad depends entirely on the intent of the one giving the test. Yes, oh, yeah, and the outcome, <laughs> right? And in mine, it also says to prove. In other words, once the test has been accomplished, once they have tested you, the outcome proves where you are, who you are, what you are, right? To prove. Um, pardon? Yes, there we go. I wanted to get into that, to entice. And when he's enticing, uh, in the case of this particular contact, it's to entice you to sin. Right? That's what the temptation was in this context. He wants you to disobey God, to not believe God. All right? In James, then, we went into the book of James, uh, 1, 13 to 15. Now, here's where we learn that it says that uh, temptation does not come from God. So let's define where, where it does come from. Yeah, it's when we are enticed. There, there's that word entice. We are enticed by our own lust. Okay, and that's in verse 14 of that reference, 13 and 14. Okay. Um, I also, we also looked up that word lust. So what happened is temptation took us to see lust. So then she asked us, look up lust, right? And that was number 1937. She actually gave us the numbers. And that's because we were in the Old Testament primarily. And in order to get there, you have to move into the New Testament to get these words. These are Greek word studies. Okay, and what does it mean to lust? To seek, desire, long for. Yeah, passion. It, it's, if you have to really talk about, lusting requires a meditation of your mind, doesn't it? It requires that you engage, dance with the thoughts that are going on there. To set the heart upon. I like that one, to set the heart upon. Yes, you could, but not under a temptation that's trying to make you sin, <laughs> to set the heart up, upon. Because in the context of this subject matter of temptation, the temptation is to defy God or to disobey God, right? Okay, and then when lust gives birth, what happened? When lust gives birth, so here you are still in your mind. You've got a mind thing going on here, right? There's 
There's my little guy. He's thinking about it. He's longing for it. But when that, so once it leaves this mind concept, although there is a verse in the New Testament that says just thinking about it, 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 it can be sin, right? Um, because why do you think that is? Why do you think that verse kind of goes? In this, in this verse it says once you long for it, once you dwell on it for a period of time, then it gives birth to sin, right? When lust gives birth, um, oh, when, wait a second. When lust conceives, when lust conceives, then it gives birth. to sin. So kind of there's a distinction there. So if I dwell on it and think on it, in, in the Matthew verse that we looked at, it can be sin for you, right? Jesus says if you lust after her in your heart, then you've already committed adultery in your mind. But the, the act of sinning is what? It's exactly that. It's an action. It's an action, right? It gives birth to sin, which is an action. Right? Okay. Right. But it's in your mind, yeah. He really was. So, so Thank you. Know, you know, obviously, this is where it's like, okay, if you do this, that's sin. And Jesus is saying, it's inside y'all. Mm -hmm. Right. And it that's is. Why you need a savior. Okay, that was kind of why I went back earlier and talked to you about the legal standing of where you are concerning being a sinner versus the reality of an action, which is sin. Sin is an action. What Jesus was making the point about is if you're dwelling on this and you don't put it to, if you don't, if you don't stop it, if you don't bring, uh, uh, okay, let me, let's do this. Go to Genesis 4. Let's see what verse is it in. Um, I wasn't going to take you there yet, but uh, 4, 7. We're going to get into this when we get to our next chapter, but this is a principle that shows you that there is a responsibility that we have to, um, take control of our mind so that we don't commit the act. Because act, sin is an action. In your heart, though, it can give birth by your dwelling on it. What happens if you don't, if you don't rein in your thoughts? Pretty soon you start acting it out, right? If you think on it for too long and you don't stop it, then it will become an action and you sin. But why he, and he's exactly right. What Jesus did was he talk, he was taking the principle about sin and he was bumping it up to higher standing and saying, look, if you keep dwelling on this, if you don't, if you don't rein that in, that's going to be, that is going to be sin for you. And, it, and you're thinking on it for long periods of time. That itself can be sin if you never rein it in. You may never act it out, but you just keep thinking on it. You just keep. Yes. Is in the present tense, which implies ongoing habitual. It, there you go. That's what I'm saying. If you don't rein it in, you just keep letting it go and keep letting it go. In your mind, you're committing that, that sin in your mind over and over. But what we're, yes, exactly. So what we're trying to do is nuance between temptation and sin, because how many of us are tempted in our lives? Uh, yeah, we can all double raise both arms and both legs if we could do that gracefully. So we all know temptation is out there. We also know that a fleeting thought can come to the mind, right? There you go. Yep. Yep. Right. I know. Their floor needs mopping, but they've got to go to the That's gym. Yeah. And, but, but also, here's the whole thing about you know, money and all the, you know, and power and all these things. I mean, it's just constantly at it. You want to hate people? Watch the news. 
Right. No kidding. All it is is this. No, you are absolutely right. You are. Yes, there you go. Like the Temptation is a reality and sin is a choice. So what, somebody read that uh, Genesis passage 417, I think it was. 47, thank you. So what Jesus tells us in that, or God tells us in that very quick little verse is that sin is there. It's crouching at your door and it can be dancing around in your mind. But he replies to uh, Cain and says, but you must master it. So that tells us something about sin, right? Temptations are going to come, but can we overcome them? Do we have a responsibility to overcome them? Yes. Lovely and pure, and yes. Right, right. But what does that require? A change, of mind. a change of mind, discipline, right? A renewing of the mind. And how do you go about renewing your mind? What, do you, what transforms your mind? The word of God. So where, where we see Eve fail is that she's not dwelling on the word of God in particular. She even added to it because she was resentful about the one word of law that she was given. And, and she did not converse with her husband about it. So she didn't engage in any kind of wisdom or guidance from the one who was supposed to be the leader. And, and then she went back and she began to engage in it. She said that, it said that she, where did I see it? That um, she, she, what she knew and what she saw. So she went back. She knew the word of God already. Well, now she went back and started pondering on it. Here we've got her thinking on this, right? Her little thoughts are going, hmm, that's cool. I'm liking that. That's a great idea. So she saw this stuff and she's going, yeah, I want this. I want this. I want this. Those are great. Let's do that. And so she pondered on it. She did not master it. And I love the fact that God gave us that verse in, in chapter four. You must master it. And Cain didn't. And Cain didn't. And so No. And so God told Cain, hey, look out. This is coming yeah. away. And if you don't, if you don't feed it, it's blowing it. Yeah. And the fact that you bring that up, too, is another thing that I think is going to be an important part of this. We, we see that then sin is a choice. So let's write that up here. Consequences. Sin is a choice. There you go. Right, because first of all, God's already told us you must master it. So that means we can master it, right? Number two, we, we also know that um, he... A way of escape, right. Yeah. Um, well, but we looked at a lot of verses where we said, well, how do you master it? Sin's a choice. How do we master it? How do we master it? So um, we looked at um, Psalm 119, Matthew 26. Remember, go to page 28. We're going to jump ahead a little bit and just start a list on this. How do we master it? We know that sin's a choice, right? And... But it does say there is none righteous, no, not one. And Paul says, what a wretched man am I. Yeah. And that one is a verse, I got to tell you, it kind of, it's one of those, you got to remember, he is doing a diatribe conversation between the antinomian and the Judaizer, and these are both unbelievers. He's not talking to the Christians in, those, in that verse in Romans. He's saying, 
thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord we can have the victory. But he's saying the man who tries to follow the Jewish, the Jewish law system, he can't win. The guy who's the, the Gentile who lives in sin, he can't win. You can't do it by your own flesh and by your own effort. That's where I wanted to go and that's what you brought up. And that is, okay, so we're required to master it. We're told that, th that he won't leave us without a way of escape. So how do we get there? So what, is it, what does it say? How do we do this? What are those verses? What does it say in Psalm 119? Treasure your word. Yeah. Treasure God's word. Um, in other words, you are to know, to know it, and you are to remember it. That's one of the first things that you need to know about how you are going to master this chin, this, this subject of sin, because it is a choice. Okay, that's Psalm 119 and 11. That's a good passage to have memorized. Uh, Yes. Yeah, that saw, we looked at Hebrews 2 and 4, I think it was. Yeah. Okay, so how we master it. Okay, so the first thing we want to know is we need to treasure God's word. The second one is we need to then turn to Jesus, who is our high priest, yeah, who understands. You know what I thought, what hit me really strongly this time, this time about that particular passage was, when I'm studying that, I remember studying that whole thing out when we did the book of Hebrews, but I wasn't studying Genesis or the subject of sin. So now I go back to it. Now I'm getting a little different nuance on it, and I'm thinking that's very interesting. One of the things we need to remember, we're man. We're not God in flesh. He was God in flesh. So he had a one-up on us, but he took on flesh that he would experience so for our benefit, that we would understand he understands, number one, but also there's all the legal parts of it. But that now what we can do is we can look upon Jesus from the perspective that when I go to him, I know he knows. I know he knows. He always knew. He didn't have to experience it to know it. But now I know he knows, right? So I go to him. I know he knows. I also know that when he was tempted, what? He did not sin. So I have someone who understands my thing. He understands my temptation. He understands my flesh. He understands my weakness. But when he, he came in flesh, he did it. He did not sin. So what does that tell me about him? He's stronger than me. He's, be, he's bigger, better. He's my, he is my protector. And so Knowing that, then I can go to him as God, my Savior, as my Savior, and rely on him to save me in that moment of temptation. He's that second Adam, the creature. Yes. Yes, he's, that's what he is. He's my protector and my provider and my priest. So here in this book specifically, he's the great high priest who understands. And he's also, as the great high priest in that in that picture that they set up there in, in that particular book, the Jews understand the position of the priest and who it is, who they are to go to and why they go to him. So they, there's all these other scenarios in that that you can kind of add into it. But knowing that Jesus knows our, our flesh, he took on flesh and blood so that he could be our great high priest. So first of all, that was sacrificial. Therefore, we can now draw near to the throne we can receive his mercy and grace to help. And P.S. and by the way, in chapter, in chapter 2 of that Hebrews, it says, what did he do to the devil? He rendered him powerless, right? He defeated him. So I'm looking at a great high priest who has already defeated him. He came to this earth. He didn't sin because he's God. 
which is just. But, but a, he, was, he was fully man. He was fully man. So, so I think the important piece is he showed that it could be done. Yeah. 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 Is it possible for any man to never sin? No. 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 But God. But, but is it possible for man to resist? Sin? Yes. 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 And that's the point. And so my point is, first of all, in that picture there, what I say is, he was God come in flesh. He took it on so he would experience the temptation that we would understand he understands. That's helpful in the mind of a man. We look at God and say he understands because he took it on and he became flesh for us for many reasons. But in this subject of conversation, it helps me to go to a great high priest who understands my weakness, who understands the temptation. Yet he did not sin. That part of it doesn't necessarily, to me, take me to the place of knowing, well, then that means I can have victory. But what it does tell me is that he, he was victorious because he is God. That means he is God who came in flesh to take it on for me. And I can know that he is my God and my Savior. And therefore, I turn to him when I'm in weakness. He understands I can't, and apart from him. And that, I think, is the real point, is apart from turning to God, we cannot resist temptation. If you don't turn to God, you are setting yourself... I kind of made a list on this. And you get the helper, right? So it's clear That's that it. Our own because we have to have the Holy Spirit to kind of help. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Keep watching and praying. Why? Because you keep relying on God. Okay. We can, we can and we must draw near to Jesus as our source of help in time of need. That's what I drew out of chapter 4, verse 16. And then this is what I kind of added as additional notes. Number one, do not attempt it alone. First of all, the reason she got into big trouble is she stood there alone and she didn't tap into her resources that God gave her. Be forewarned, you are not strong enough to do battle without armor or protection. You need to be prepared and you need to know who your protector is, right? Also, it's possible for you to also turn to your brothers and sisters in Christ and turn to your spouse and ask them to help you in your areas of weakness. And you know what they are, whatever they are. Get people on board with you to help you as well. But first and foremost, get God on your side. You need to be turning to him. Jesus defeated Satan. But guess what? We're not God in human flesh. We are Adam's flesh. Don't forget that. Remember that and plan accordingly. You can't do it alone. No matter how hard you try, you're not going to be successful in temptation if you don't turn this over to God, if you don't go to God to get the instruction, if you don't go use the Holy Spirit to guide you and direct you, if you don't rely on that, if you don't immediately take those thoughts captive to the foot of the cross, as it says in Corinthians, because that's where the victory is. And, and there, I thought about the one in, I think it was Ephesians, where it says, um, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against, against principalities and powers. It's the, it's the heavenly realm that we are fighting. It's the satanic realm that we are fighting. That's what she was fighting. She just didn't either acknowledge it or recognize it. And, and quite honestly, I think the implication here is she should have recognized it. The fact that he was so crafty, he was unique from the rest of the animals, it should have including, clued her in that there was something else going on there. Um, yes, that's right. So put on the, the armor of God. Right, right. You're f- you. Right. And you need my armor and my tools. Right. So now let's go back and look. Okay, so th- we could, I've got so much more on here about this. Let's see. Um, we did um, keep watching and pray, right? That was in uh, Matthew 26. I think you all got this, correct? Did you k- see that in your cross references on page 28? Okay, so that's Matthew 26, 41. What did it say in 1 Corinthians 10 that we're supposed to do? Yeah, you better be taking heed. 
don't think that you're okay on your own, that you can handle it, that those temptations are, are nothing to you. Now, it is true that as time moves uh, along in your life, there are some things you do master. You get them mastered. That's what Jesus told Cain to do, or what, that's what God told Cain to do. I'm putting Jesus right there in that garden every time. But he told him, you must master it, and he expected him to do so. And he had the ability, and it wasn't too late even at that point. He could have taken those thoughts captive, turned them, but instead he didn't. He went, he went out and killed his brother, and he took it from the mind to action. It went from temptation to sin. Right? So this is what we're seeing here about sin. Sin is an action. Temptation is in the mind. And the only way to stop it from becoming an action in your life is to master it. Take it captive to the foot of the cross. You are to keep watching and praying. You are to take, every, to take heed that this is out there, that you have an enemy that wants to devour you. You need to turn to Jesus, who is your, your high priest who understands. He did not sin, and he can be the one to protect you. He can protect you. He can help. He can protect. Right? He's already won the battle. He can do that for you. Um, God will provide a way of escape. He will, God, I guess I should put this, Jesus will provide a way of escape. And that was in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And the other one was it said in Galatians, that how else are you going to be able to overcome it? Walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. Okay, we're getting close to being done here. We're good. Um, 5.16. Okay, now let's go back and look at what Jesus did then. How did Jesus do this? How did Jesus master? Um, okay, I'm, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do this. I'm going to just check off everywhere Jesus did exactly what we just made a list on. He, he did what about the word? He treasured it, right? What else? What else did he do? He did keep watching and praying. He was out there for 40 days and 40 nights. And even up prior to that, he had, had gone in prepared, right, through the fasting and praying. Okay. Yeah. The armor of God. He used that armor of God. Let's just put that on here. Use God's word as your weapon but use it correctly not like eve did right let's go to ephesians 6 and i don't remember if it's 13 or something like that in there okay use god's word as your weapon ephesians 6 so jesus did that he used the word of god right what if, yeah there you go i wanted to say didn't he walk by the spirit it says that he was led by the spirit even into that so he was walking by the spirit uh, when he talks about uh, taking heed, when he spoke in reply to Satan, did he even name him by name? Did he identify who, who his real enemy was in that moment? He actually said he turned to Satan and he said, Satan, I rebuke you or something along those lines, right? Is that what he did? I can't remember now. Gonna... Be gone from here, right. So he literally identifies Satan in that. Uh, let me see if I've got it written down here. Verse 10. Yeah, 10? Yeah. Go, Satan. So he, he was taking heed. He knew who he was up against. He had assessed his enemy and what was going on there. So what's really interesting to me is when you look at Jesus in, in the Matthew 4, everything that we just listed when we looked at these cross-references and how we are going to be able to master sin, which is a choice, is to do exactly what Jesus did and what the rest of the Word of God instructs us to do. And that, that's a pretty cool... The extra point of being able to turn to him. Yes. It's the only one that he didn't do because he rejected. Yeah. But we see he was led by the Spirit. His mind was filled up with the Word of God. He is the Word, obviously. He adhered to the Word as it is written. He didn't add to it, take away. He just quoted it. Um, 
he used the word of God then as his weapon and he, he was alert and he recognized Satan. So Jesus took on flesh and blood so that we could have a great high priest. He was successful in his temptation because he is God. Don't you and I think that we can do that without relying on him for, for our resources. He has to be your great high priest that you turn to because if you try to do it on your own, you may succeed occasionally, but you are most of the time not going to succeed. Um, I would say some of the steps then, if you think you're in a temptation, can you make a list in your mind right now? What would you do? What should you be doing? Okay, praying a lot. You should. You better be praying, prayed up. Okay, so you're you're praying on a regular basis. What else? You have a temptation. Tell somebody about it. Okay, maybe tell somebody. Turn to your spouse or turn to your close friend who's mature in faith and say, I, I'm struggling on this area or that. I need help with this. Would you be praying with me about this? Okay. There you go. Master your thoughts, right? There you go. Master your mind and renew your mind. Go back to the Word of God. Actually, it wouldn't hurt if, if you're struggling with a specific sin. See if you can find that particular sin and go in and research that in the Word of God and see what does God say about that sin. I think if you begin to read some of the consequences or some of the, the how God views that particular sin, and how he, he loathes that kind of action, and what the outcome is if you habitually remain in that, right? It, it will definitely help to turn your mind back in the right place. Yeah, right. Pink elephants, pink elephants. <laughs> yeah, all you have to do is tempt us. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. When you when you did um, when you looked at the way the process of how sin unfolds for all of us, the idea of it's the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. How did you see that in Jesus's temptations? Did you see the exact same thing? It's exactly the same. Um, I went in and made a list on. Yeah, I I went in and lined those lists up. Where did I see that at? Um, Oh, here it is. Satan's tactics in Matthew 4. He appealed through his physical appetite in, in verse 3. He appealed to his personal gain in 6. And then he appealed with power and glory in 8 and 9. So it was exactly the same thing. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and boastful pride of life. Same exact thing. When you see that this is the tactic and it seems to be a pattern... What does that tell you then for you and I on a daily basis? You know what to expect. You know exactly what to expect. And being forewarned uh, is what? Forearmed. Even in a military sense, they talk, you know, about when you're in a battle, know your enemy. Yep. You know what they're going to do. Right. I loved it. And that was why I liked when Jesus looked at Satan and he called him out. And he said, be gone. I mean, he knew who his enemy was in that moment. He knew what he was up against, and he was not having any of it. He didn't falter one iota. Now, poor Eve fell right into it. The moral of this story for us as far as the book of Genesis on the whole and what we're going to be observing here is what about humanity then? Because in Romans 5, we went into Romans 5, and what did we see there? Do you remember that one? Yes, read that. Uh, therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who, is, who was to come. Okay, so in that, what we do is we, again, federal headship is set down. It's a legal standing that's, that's presented to us to understand legally where we stand with God. And that is that all men are sinners. And you start out that way from the womb. And what does that mean then, again, 
what does that mean for you and I if we want to not be held responsible as sinners? You have to accept Jesus Christ. Now here's, let me see if I've got this one. Um, John 5, 24 says it this way. Whoever hears my word and believes has passed from death to life. So you must hear the word of God, believe it, turn from your wicked ways, right? Then you receive, you pass from death to life. So when I've taught this before, I have shown basically two umbrellas, two different kinds of umbrellas. Okay, and this is in Christ. Over here you are in Adam. This is where you are born automatically. You are here. You start there from the moment of birth. That's what Romans 5 is telling us. And it, and it shows us that also with Adam and Eve, the fact that God cast them out of the, the garden. It prevented any other human being that would be born from them from going and doing the exact same thing. And, and you, you know, the fact that Jesus says that he died once for all, there was the many transgressions that, that are permeated throughout the earth. And every man sins because every man is a sinner. There is, n there is none righteous, no, not one. What God sh is showing us is that fundamentally, as human beings within our DNA, so to speak, we are sinners. We have a free will. We're given the option to choose, but, all, but we will every time go the wrong way at some point, every one of us. And that is a cognitive uh, realization that a person has to come to. This is why you must talk about sin if you're going to draw a person into faith. If they don't understand the concept that they are a sinner and that they need saving, then you can't get them from this federal headship of being in Adam to the federal headship of being in Christ. Once you believe, right, you are carried over here and now you are in Christ. So, but if you don't believe, where do you stay? You're born here and in Adam what happens? Death. In Christ, what happens? Yep. Yes. You're so, in Romans, that's Romans 6 and 7. Uh, that's another one. Go from Romans 5 to setting up the, the federal headship. Then go on to Romans 6 and 7. And you cover the idea of your, and actually eight also, you're a slave to, to sin or, or to um, God, right? You're, or, or you're dead to the flesh and you're alive in the spirit. So it gives you these contrasts on each of those three chapters about the idea of federally moving. So he tells you about how you federally move in five. And then he tells you in chapter six what the contrast is. The contrast for being in death and being in life. All right. Well, I think we did pretty good. Were there any other questions to cover before we? Well, I think we did it. It was a, it was a, I did, I finished on time and you didn't think I could. <laughs> Thank you guys. We'll see you next week.